please welcome our new speaker, Jim von Herr. I was uh, started as an engineer and uh, started my own company in 84, had the great uh, luck to sell it for more money than I thought possible in 95, and I started the world's first nanotechnology company in 97. And my idea when I started this company was that I would do create uh, atomically precise manufacturing, which would give me the tools to do the next thing that I wanted in life, which was to build a seastead. So uh, I thought I was just one lone crazy guy at the time. It was uh, great to find the Seasteading Institute. I'm going to talk about uh, some of the companies that I have uh, formed and the things that we're doing. So a little touchy. Okay, so uh, as I said, I started uh, Zyvex in 97 to develop molecular nanotechnology. And uh, we've commercialized some nano manipulation tools. Uh, we have a materials company, and we're still doing research in the field. So what I mean by molecular nanotechnology is the uh, precise controlled rearrangement of atoms into a more valuable form. For example, if we take this lump of coal, a lot of carbon atoms, some impurities, uh, because they're jumbled together, it doesn't have a very high value. However, if we take the same atoms and rearrange them into a different form, such as a diamond, they have a much higher value. Now, that is not my goal with nanotechnology, because if we could take those same atoms and rearrange them into uh, medical nanorobots, uh, into energy harvesting devices, the value would be much higher than a diamond. If you could take, if I had a cubic meter of diamond, the first one of those might be worth a billion dollars, the second one, not so much. But if I had a cubic meter of medical nanorobots that could cure cancer, that's worth a lot. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're trying to do is learn from nature. We don't follow nature, but we want to, to see that nature has shown that something is possible. One of my favorite natural objects is the abalone shell. And the abalone takes calcium carbonate out of the ocean and a biopolymer and puts those together in a very precise way. In layers, crystalline structures separated by the biopolymer, and it makes a shell that is 3,000 times tougher than either material alone. So imagine what we could do if we had engineering strength materials, because this is basically just chalk and snot put together. Uh, what could we do if we had really high performance polymers and high performance uh, epoxies? So it's amazing to think where we can go with nano. Uh, we're not going to do exactly this, but we learn from nature. So my favorite nano machine is the acorn. And you think, what's in the acorn? It's an energy supply in the form of the nut, uh, the germ cells, which have the DNA recipe on how to build an oak tree. And they're able to, this is the world's most green manufacturing plant, literally, because uh, it takes dirt, water, and air and rearranges those molecules into wood, which humans have used throughout our history to build things. Wood is actually a very excellent nanomaterial but I'm an engineer and we have to have a different way. So we're going to build small machines that rearrange the molecules to build things. So in the course of developing this, and it turned out to be a much harder problem than I thought, uh, we have spun off some companies, uh, Zyvex Instruments, uh, making nano manipulators, Zyvex Performance Materials, which makes some of the advanced materials I'm gonna show you later in the talk and then Zyvex Labs, which is still doing research in atomically precise manufacturing. Now, the Zyvex Instruments, uh, our prime product was this nano manipulator, so eight little fingers that can go in and land on an integrated circuit, and this can probe the world's most advanced integrated circuits. We've saved the semiconductor industry billions of dollars in cost by being able to go into the nano world, measure the properties of one transistor, and they can then go back and change their process just a little bit, what they learn. And by improving the, the yields in the process, 
they can actually get more working chips out of the same number of starting wafers. So basically it saves them the waste and it's an incredibly lucrative um, machine to use. Uh, we were not able to capture all the value of that, but we have saved the industry billions. Uh, that company was acquired several years ago. That's what our system looks like. So a rack of our equipment, a conventional electron microscope, uh, a lot of software that we developed, and then an image of these probes landing on an integrated circuit. Moving on to the performance materials company, we had a breakthrough about uh, 15 years ago in processing carbon nanotubes, the world's toughest material. Uh, we moved the company up to Ohio a while back. We have a number of products that we make uh, used in boats, uh, some prototype uh, parts for an airplane, a bicycle. We have a mountain bike that uh, a normal mountain bike, would, th the racer would break at least five of those bikes during a racing season. With our bike, they haven't broken one yet. Uh, we, we have a boat that I'm going to show you later. Um, and this is my company, Zycraft. I have a separate presentation on it. Uh, moving quickly into the research part, uh, what we're trying to do still with nanotechnology is create a, a manufacturing revolution. So I say humans, History has gone from handcrafting blacksmith, uh, a person who can make almost anything one at a time, but has no uh, mass production. Henry Ford, at the turn of the last century, realized if he made standardized parts, put them together in a standardized way, he could make an automobile pretty cheaply. And he revolutionized the world of transportation, the world of manufacturing. Intel and Texas Instruments uh, in, in the, the 60s and 70s realized that if they could do uh, the right kind of semiconductor lithography, basically shining light through a mask that blocks the light in certain parts, they could make the transistors through a series of, of de deposit and etch steps. They could make the transistors for integrated circuits. And you know what a revolution that has been. What we want to do is create the atomically precise manufacturing revolution where we can do the economies of scale of the semiconductor industry with the types of chemistry that we all care about because rearranging atoms is key to the next manufacturing boom. Uh, we're made of atoms, the world is made of atoms, and if we get better control of those, we're going to create a huge amount of economic well-being. This is what our system looks like to do this, ultra-high vacuum scanning tunneling microscope the business end of that. If we have this tungsten needle etched just right, it ends in a single atom. And this machine can bring that down onto a silicon surface and pop individual atoms off the surface and move individual atoms around. And our goal is to, to get better and better at building. We have one joint venture that we started that kind of spun out of some of our other work uh, with an Israeli company called Nano Retina. And here we're actually building a bionic eye, taking some of the technology that we've developed in the past. Uh, we have this little glass encapsulated package. You can see it next to a coin here. It has a bed of needles electrodes. Uh, right now it's 26 by 26 electrodes. It sticks into the back of the eye. The image lands on this image sensor. There's a computer chip underneath. There are solar cells sensitive to infrared. And the image lands on here. It is transformed into stimulating pulses in the electrode, in the eye. It stimulates the nerves in the eye and will restore vision to the blind. <coughs> so human trials start later this year. All right, that's the story of the, the first batch of companies. Now I want to talk about how we commercialize this. So several years ago, some of my guys came to me at Zybex Performance Materials and said, we really need a demo of, of uh, using these advanced materials. And I was thinking, okay, let's build a bike. And they said, let's build a boat. And well, I, the first couple of times I said no, but then you know, my people's enthusiasm kind of was contagious. So finally I said, I'm, I'm not really a boat guy, but okay, let's build a boat. So we built a, uh, 
a 17 meter boat out of, out of this material. We went from little panels this big to a 17 meter boat. I have to say it's been an exciting ride in the nanotech field because this all grew out of one of my scientists, a Chinese scientist had come up with a process. He had a little black speck on a microscope slide about that big. And I walked into his lab one day and I said, or into his office it was, and he said, what's that? He said, well, I've learned how to process carbon nanotubes, which no one else in the world had been able to do. And he was just very nonchalant about it. He was gonna publish something in a prestigious chemistry journal. I said, have you patented this? No. <laughs> so uh, we, we quickly filed the patent, we published the thing. And he told me, nobody's gonna pay attention to us because we're a small company, they won't notice us. And in fact, that was right. Even though we had a breakthrough, uh, no one really did pay much attention. But we've gone from this little black speck on the microscope slide to a boat. And this is a pretty fantastic boat. I'm gonna talk about the specs for it. So when we built this boat, we tried to, to market it in the US for a while. We got very little interest Singapore government was interested in drone boats. So I hired away a vice president of one of their defense contractors, who was a former fleet commander of the Singapore Navy, uh, James Soon, and set him up as president of this company. We brought the boat to Singapore. We ended up in a joint venture with an anti-pirate operator out of Dubai. We built two more manned boats, and the idea was to go into the maritime security business. So we currently have a smallish company uh, operating our drone boat and operating the two manned boats. So here are some pictures of our drone boat in action. Uh, we have a, uh, you can't see them in this picture I guess, we have two radar, or two uh, satellite domes, uh, radar, cameras. And that's a better picture of the boat in action. Uh, this is optionally manned, so we can put people aboard. There's a little cockpit. We steer it with a joystick instead of a, a steering wheel. And it's all fly-by-wire, total computer control of the boat. Uh, there, there are no cords or hydraulic lines going between the control system and the engines. So as I said, it's a state-of-the-art uh, material that's carbon fiber, carbon nanotubes, and epoxy. And the nanotubes, at the time we built this boat, we were about 20% better than the best material in the world. Now we're about 50% better than the best in the world. That allows us to have a much lighter boat. We can use less material, so <laughs> the boat is lighter, so we can use smaller engines and have more room for fuel. And I'm pleased to report that just Saturday night, this boat came home from a 22-day unmanned mission at sea, in the South China Sea. So that was quite a milestone, the longest it has been out. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the longest it had been out uh, being driven from shore before that was about 18 hours. So uh, going from 18 hours to 22 days was uh, pretty, pretty tension-provoking on us. We had a chase boat with some crew to deal with things if they went wrong. And uh, for example, at one point, we, we noticed only one of our engines was working right. Uh, the other one had blown a fuse. You know, how, do you, how do you plan for a blown fuse? So I, I told my, my troops on board the chase boat, uh, you guys are the man in unmanned. So <laughs> you have done a great job. But because of the nanomaterials, this boat is much lighter than a conventional boat. So when it's there's no fuel in it, it's about seven and a half tons. A conventional boat would be two or three times that weight. Uh, we get incredible range and pretty high speeds. And uh, that's a picture of the boat so you can get a sense of scale. Uh, the two satellite terminals, um, radar up here. We have more stuff on the mast now since we took this picture. This is our control station at the base in Singapore. And uh, while we were out at sea, we had uh, some of our crew was in the chase boat. Uh, we had two people that alternated during uh, 24 hours a day for 22 days, alternated our base station here in Singapore. So we have uh, a picture of the, some of the, we have 18 
cameras on board. We have a 360 degree view. Uh, we have the control panel. We have actually the instrument gauge. We have other kinds of data we can see on this boat. We have a, a chart showing where we are. A lot of communication statistics. Uh, we have to send a huge amount of data over a pretty small bandwidth satellite link to make this work. Uh, this is a picture of kind of a blow up of the, the chart showing this is the obstacle avoidance working. So when it's running on its own, we basically set a course and we tell it to go. And we monitor that from the base. We can drive it manually from the base, but because of the satellite delays and the satellite loss, the boat has to be able to be autonomous. So we, we set a course. This fan is showing what it sees in front of it. Here it's seeing a boat behind it. It's in yellow because that's more important to avoid. Uh, we don't see anything in front right now. We have various rings of how far out we're looking. And basically, we, we set the boat out, and uh, it runs on its own. Uh, at night, we have infrared cameras. This is a blow up of the, the instrument gauge, showing all the normal instruments you would see, some control buttons, status of things. Uh, there are multiple tabs across here. We actually have several hundred data points of telemetry, and we can monitor those, change things, reconfigure on the fly. Uh, this is a, a blow up of our camera display. So the 360 degree staring camera is looking all the time. And uh, flagging some targets here with boxes where it sees targets. And that feeds in now to the obstacle avoidance. So we can avoid targets that we see on radio or on radar or on vision. Uh, the modular payload bay, actually we had a little cartoon picture showing the payload bay of this thing is big enough to put a small Jeep into where we could have cargo specialized loads put into it. Now we've done some, some renderings. We don't have the actual rescue configuration yet, but we are doing medevac services in Singapore. Uh, we've partnered with Hope Medical to be able to evacuate people from boats that get injured, bring them to shore, because our top speed of this boat, uh, a, a manned boat, uh, is almost, uh, well, we've, we've reconfigured a bit. I think it's 35 knots now. Uh, we can get them back to shore pretty quickly. Uh, these boats have a, a sea keeper stabilizer. It's a gyroscopic stabilizer that spins at a thousand, it, it's a thousand pound disc spinning at 9,700 RPM on hydraulic actuators. Uh, and I have a video of that in a, in a bit here. Uh, hopefully it'll play. But uh, the, when it's on, uh, this normal kind of rocking motion is stabilized, so the boat is very stable. It makes a huge difference when the crew is aboard. So getting into the manned boats here, uh, we use those around the Singapore waters now for maritime security. We will go out and guard ships, drill ships, drill rigs, barges, whatever our customers need. And there is increasing piracy around the waters of Singapore. You don't hear about that as much as you do Somalia because the people in Singapore are, uh, the pirates are less violent. They normally just tend to come rob people on the boats. They don't actually kidnap and kill them. But some of the escorts that we have done, this is all made possible by our advanced nanomaterials. So we can have fairly small engines, carry a lot of fuel. And one thing I forgot to mention about our drone boat is that at, in the 22 days, we went 1,800 miles, and we used about half a tank of fuel. <coughs> So we actually could go for probably 40 days and go at least 3,500 miles on one tank of fuel, all enabled by our nanomaterials, showing the hull being made. This boat is actually made in a, in a mold. We put the material in, in the raw form. We roll it into a big oven, which you can see behind here. <coughs> we cure it overnight. Uh, this is inside our boatyard. Uh, after we cure it, we pop the whole hull out of the thing, and the whole hull is one continuous piece fused together. 
We have some nice bunks down below, a little galley area, sleeping quarters, Oops, a, uh, a kit, little kitchen, a shower and a toilet. Um, we have a place for our guards when we are doing an armed escort. Um, I guess you can't really see the little boat that he's looking at here. Uh, we, we do both armed and unarmed escorts in this boat. Uh, we can monitor even the manned boat from shore through satellite links. We have a thing that I, we can pull up on the computers. While we were out at sea, I was actually monitoring this on my system at home in Texas. Did a little bit of monitoring here in, in uh, French Polynesia when I, when I got here. Uh, they were still returning home. Uh, this particular display we can even pull up on a cell phone anywhere and see where are our boats in the world. And that's the display uh, showing the track of where we have been. So that's the, uh, the lab side to the market side, and this is what we're doing uh, in nanotechnology. I'm very interested in, in seasteading, figuring out how our boats can play a role. And then I have a, a video, which hopefully we can pay, play, Short video of the, the boats. Do I have to do something? Well, I guess we don't have the video. But I, I had a nice video of the boats uh, showing what this, oh, here, no. A nice video of the boats showing uh, them in operation and showing how the sea keeper helps stabilize things. It is not to be. All right, well, thanks for your attention.